myopia control making a difference. John Bolger, a consultant ophthalmologist who completed his training at the Royal Free Hospital and Northfield's Eye Hospital. He's worked as an independent eye surgeon since 1994 and is the founder and co-owner of My Eye Clinic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so here we are, the graveyard session, but I, I see myself as the main act, uh, and all the rest are just a warm-up. Um, so what we're going to talk about in this session is uh, our experience at my eye clinic, having run a myopia control clinic uh, for over a year, well, well, just coming up to a year, which included uh, the use of uh, dispensing atropine eye drops to, to our patients. So. Um, the reason we started the My Eye Clinic, Myopia Control Clinic, was because we had many young children with myopia, and I could see that they needed to be referred to a myopia control clinic. These were young children who are seriously myopic, at way more than their parents had been at similar ages and so on. And I was quite surprised that despite all the evidence that was there, none of my ophthalmic colleagues at fairly significant institutions had thought it necessary to start a myopia control clinic. Um, and eventually we decided, well, if, if they're not going to do it, we're going to have to do it ourselves. Um, more for clinical reasons than financial reasons, actually. So we decided, okay, let's, let's offer myopia control uh, to, to, to children who are, who, who are myopic. So we started uh, just a, a, almost a year ago, um, and we were pretty rapidly inundated uh, by cases of, of, of young patients with myopia who were quite surprising to us. So we had children younger than the age of eight who already could not be a pilot. They'd gone beyond minus six and they hadn't even reached the age of eight. So if they wanted to be a pilot or a fireman when they grew up, it wasn't going to be possible for them. Um, and again, we were quite surprised to find that most of them had a, a significant axial length way beyond a, a normal adult, even before the age of, the age of 10 or, or, or 8. And we um, offer, uh, therefore we decided, not in addition to the normal myopia control uh, me measures, which you, 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 you may we'll talk about shortly, we also we offer them atropine. Now atropine uh, is a drop we use quite regularly in, op in pediatric ophthalmology um, at a 1% dose. The dosage for used in, in myopia control is one hundredth that uh, of, the, of, of use in, in uh, conventional pediatric ophthalmology. But of course it's used on a continuous basis. Now there isn't, uh, strictly speaking, a license for the use of 0.01% atropine in, in children for the control of myopia. Uh, but, you know, somebody's got to make a start. Um, and there are many, many, many areas of, of ophthalmology and of medicine generally where a drug is used outside this license because it's so obviously beneficial. Um, one of them would, would be um, aspirin. Uh, many of us would take a gram of aspirin for a headache, which you buy over the counter, no prescription. But for quite some time it would have been illegal to take 50 milligrams for your heart because it didn't have a license for use as an antiplatelet drug for patients with myocardial uh, problems. But of course it does now. So there's a, there's a whole history of drugs finding a new uh, uh, application um, on the basis of being found to be useful in that condition. So we don't have any uh, concerns about the safety and of course the efficacy of atropine eye drops in the use in children with myopia. But we're still surprised that we're the only clinic that we know of uh, in, uh, in England and, and U in UK generally who is uh, able to supply patients with, with, with atropine eye drops. So most of this has been covered by previous speakers uh, and I'm very glad to see that I'm not a lone voice in the wilderness. Uh, that a lot of my colleagues, both in the academic side of ophthalmology and many of the ac academic optometric uh, speakers today have been really hammering home this pandemic that we're facing of, of myopia. So we're seeing more children becoming myopic. They're becoming myopic earlier. 
um, they, their myopia is progressing for longer, they're, they're sort of well into their 20s and, and, even, and even beyond. And many of them, many of the children we're seeing now will be among those patients who will go blind during their working life from myopia. So it is a catastrophic, it's cataclysmic what's, what's coming, what's facing us. Our belief is that it's entirely due to the lifestyle of the 20th, 20th, 21st century. Um, you've, previous speakers have talked about uh, you know, the, the, the reasons why we think we're seeing more myopia. We know it's not genetic, although we do know there are genes that can protect someone in a myopic inducing environment from myopia and there are also other genes that will encourage the development of myopia if the trigger is pulled. So if we all lived a, an emotropic lifestyle, none of us would become myopic, but some of us are more susceptible than others because of our genetic makeup uh, to being myopic, but it's not the gene that makes you myopic, it may just make you susceptible to, to my, myopia. Um, and, and we're all familiar with the, the visual deprivation studies and severing the nerve and, and how atropine stops all those changes to, taking, taking place. And of course, we have to think differently about myopia now, because in, in the past it was, it was like losing your hair. It's something you're accepted, there's nothing you can do about it. But now myopia is manageable. And I think, uh, I think optometry has come to the point where if you next week see a young child with myopia, I think, I think all your peers now are, are of the opinion that you have to tell the, the, the family there are things you can do to slow down the amount of myopia that your child will develop, and that if you don't inform them of those options, you may find that your, uh, your standard of care is below what your peers would regard as reasonable. Um, and as I say, although the College of Optometry's position is variable, they do at least acknowledge that patients should be told, when they're diagnosed with myopia, that there are treatments that are available. And it's, it's out of control. It, it, it's, uh, you know, in the Far East, you can see how the, the rate, and you've, you've seen this graph on other slides, other talks at this, at this meeting to this weekend, and you can see that in the 1950s, it was around 20%, and now, 2010, uh, which is 10 years ago, it's, it's really a, a, a accelerating. And we know that in Singapore, 97% of teenagers are myopic, uh, which is horrific. And Europe is the same. If you look at, uh, here's the incidence now among, uh, related to age, and either, the only way you can explain this is that either all myopes die around 55, so that's why there are no older ones, or there are more myopes coming. And when they get into this age, when you can imagine when this gets here, the number of people going blind from myop myopic degeneration and other conditions associated with myopia is going to be very significant. And this is another uh, analysis of the same data set showing that uh, low myopia is, is very much increased. Uh, high myopia is not so increased, but it probably is going to be increasing as, as, as you continue in your careers. Uh, so you're the people out there treating these, these, uh, these patients. Um, and in, in a sense, it's interesting. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an ophthalmologist, so I, I cure people of vision problems. You don't. You, you just give glasses and contacts and so on. But this myopia epidemic is, the, is, is something where you and how you practice could save people's vision. And this is a, I think this is a first. So opt optometry up to now has been sort of a reactive uh, profession, but if optometry grasps this issue of the pandemic of myopia, you could be the very people who save millions, billions of people going blind in, in, in the future. So I think it's a very exciting for optometry as well as for ophthalmology, as well as for society in, in general. So you know, I, I encourage you to really embrace this. So at my eye clinic, we, we, sort of had to, we had to learn new stuff, which wasn't in the textbooks. Uh, we had to look at normal eye growth, because although myopia is measured in diopters of, of uh, sphere and so on, it's really the axial length that we're in interested in. And we know that, you can think about it this way, that the eye is flat-packed at birth. 
Um, it comes out at zero at about 17 to 18 millimeters from cornea to retina. And most of the growth in the first year, so you see at the end of the first year, it's grown about two to three millimeters. Most of that growth is in the anterior chain. Um, not in the overall length, it's in the anterior chamber. So from, from about one year to about late teens, it, it then develops to about another three or four millimeters in, in total. So the adult axial length should be about 23 to 24 millimeters from the front of the cornea to the fovea. And of course, a young child should be hyperopic. Um, so a four-year-old, if you see a four-year-old and they're plano, they are going to be myopic. And we have four-year-olds who are on atropine, are not wearing glasses, but we know they are going to be myopic. A strong family history, a, a myopic lifestyle, and already at the age of four, they're plano, they're two diopters away from where they should be. They should be about plus two, so we know they're going to be myopic. Um, and, 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 they, and of course, these are the ones in whom the treatment is most efficient, most effective. The earlier you can find these children, the better, the easier it is. These are the ones who benefit from being outdoors and, and, and so on, as well as atropine, as well as multifocal contact lenses. And, and the whole process of emetropization is failing. We, we've, uh, we know a lot more about this than we did before, and Professor, Flit, Professor Flitcroft's lecture yesterday was, was fantastic in, in how he highlighted how those cells we thought were just packing cells, the amacrine cells and some glial cells in the retina, actually appear to have a very important role in regulating eye growth, and how the feedback mechanism within the retina, particularly the peripheral retina, determines how much the eye grows. And by misinforming that layer, we're causing the eye to grow way too long. Um, but as you know, we, the, we know the eye tries to reach emetropia, so if it's got a steep cornea, it'll have a shorter length to make it, so the ones of emetropic and, and, vice, and vice versa. And this, me, this is failing, uh, this method is failing for, for all the reasons we're, we've looked at and we'll look at again. So we have children who have relatively short eyes, like maybe a 23.5 but they're wearing at age 6 or 8 at about a minus 4 or 5 because they've got a 47, 47 diopter cornea. Um, so, th whereas in the past that would have emetropized itself, uh, either a flatter cornea or a longer eye, but that mechanism isn't working um, and, and, and uh, we need to get back to it. So who are the children that come to our clinic? There are literally from all over. I mean, we even have patients flying in from Europe to come to our clinic. We were shocked when we found, we thought like we just local North London, if people come uh, and so on. But we have patients literally from all over, all over coming to it. Very often they're referred by ophthalmologists because uh, we, can, we can supply them with, with atropine. And of course the patients, of, the parents of this Vanguard group are very well informed. They've all been on the internet. They all know about Brian Holden. They all know about outdoor activity and so on. So they're, they're kind of easy to educate because they're already there. And many of them are optometrists. Uh, quite, quite a few. It's quite a, it's a sort of optometry is overrepresented among the parents of, 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 these, of these patients. And a very effective um, way of helping those non-optometrist parents understand what we're trying to do is, is things like the Brian Holden myopia calculator. And it, it helps um, parents and children to get an idea of what it is we're trying to do for them, what myopia control is trying to do, to do for them. We're trying to get them from this group, which is just glasses, into this group, which is doing something about it. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's helpful for them to, 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 to understand, understand that. And of course, many of these patients uh, are, the, the, are, are their parents are very concerned that their child already is much more myopic than they were at, at the same age. Um, so it's, been, it's typically the question of, um, well, I didn't, I'm minus eight, and I didn't start wearing glasses until I was 15. My child is six and is already minus three. So they extrapolate where they're going to wind up, and then they go online, and then they realize this is not a good place for my child to be. Um, and of course, the w Health, World Health Organization, um, that's this, and these are these children. You know, they, 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 like if you take a 10 year old now, he'd be 40 in 2050. That's 500 million blind, not myopes, blind myopes. So you, then you've got the glaucomas and the diabetes all on top of that, just from myopia. 
And of course, 500 million is the population of the entire EU. This is a huge number of blind people in the, in the world that if we don't do something about it, and it may be too late to do something about it for many of them, as you'll see from some of the cases I'm going to show, um, that it's, it's going to be an enormous burden social, economic, uh, as well as just the burden of blindness that, that, that we're going to have to carry at, at this age. And 2050 is only around the corner. Um, that you're seeing those people who will be in that 500 million blind people. You're seeing them now. You're giving them glasses now. Um, and, and we know that, you've seen the statistics, it's not, uh, it's not uh, new, 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 new science or anything like that. You, you know that at the moment we've got two and a half billion people who are myopic and we ex estimate by, uh, by tw uh, which is now 2020, that we've got a hundred million people who are high myopes. So let's just quickly look at some, some, uh, some things of what we emphasize at my eye clinic in the myopia control clinic. You, you, I hope you're all familiar with this, this diagram. It comes from more, a couple of papers uh, that were studies that were done where you, they, they know that if you visually deprive part of the retina, you block, you put some, or you take a chip or a monkey or something like that, you, you, put, you block half the retina. They can't see on that half. That half will elongate. You, you know all this, I hope. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Um, and so we know that visual deprivation triggers the mechanism that causes the eye to elongate. And although the epidemic of myopia began before the iPhone and the illuminated screen, imagine this scenario, which is a lot of people nowadays. What's happening to this person's peripheral retina? First of all, they're accommodating. They have a brightly illuminated a image on the posterior pole around the macula and the fovea and the peripheral retina is visually deprived basically isn't it i mean you 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 know you in this this is a very common scenario and basically they are doing that experiment on themselves every night hour after hour after hour so we don't just give atropine in my eye clinic we teach about the emetropic lifestyle which we come to and we also say you can't have glasses until you've failed with contact lenses or ortho -K. So we, we discourage spectacle prescription in children as a solution for the myopia or as a correction for the myopia because we know that the peripheral defocus has to be dealt with. And if you just give them glasses for the myopia, you're not dealing with the peripheral uh, uh, de defocus that, that's, a, as a, that's a consequence and that further stimulates that eye growth. So we know that undercorrecting or just giving them glasses further stimulates eye growth and makes them even more myopic. Whereas with, if you use a peripheral defocus and get the, the retina in the periphery in focus, you will slow down the rate of, of their, uh, their progression. Um, and this is, this is well understood and well, well defined and well. It's the reasoning behind multifocal contact lenses and between ortho -K. This is the same, same illustration of the same concept. Conventional correction with glasses, you've got peripheral hyper, uh, hyper focus, and it, with, with, multi, with ortho -K or with multifocal contact lenses, you eliminate that peripheral defocus and turn off that trigger. Uh, and, and make the eye grow less rapidly. So we encourage them to adopt an what we call the emotropic lifestyle. I mean, we all, there's all these other lifestyles and so on. But the emotropic lifestyle is basically what a hunter-gatherer lifestyle would have been uh, it, 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 many, many years ago. Um, because when we were hunter-gatherers, that's when the software was written about how the eye should grow, you know? It, it, it wasn't written last week or whatever. So our eyes developed their ability to emetropize while we were hunter-gatherers hunter or, or even earlier. So we encourage children to be outdoors in unfiltered daylight for a minimum of two hours a day. That works especially strong if it's early. So these are, if the children are very young and very early in the myopic 
uh, er, er, life or, or even earlier in their pre -mapping. that this is when that, that uh, axiom is most effective. A 13, 14 year old minus 4, 5 myope, it, may not, it probably is not that effective in, in terms of slowing down accident growth. Avoidance of prolonged close work. Um, I don't know if you've, any of you have got a watch, one of these watches that warns you when you've been sat down for too long. And I sometimes I sit and I read, and the next thing I think of my brain, I think oh, I've only read for 10 minutes. No, I was reading for an hour. So you get engrossed in what you're reading, and it goes on way beyond, uh, and you're just constantly accommodated at that, at that distance. And as we said already, avoid, we encourage avoiding brightly illuminated screens and dim surroundings for, for the reasons we've just looked at. And we know that the violet end of the spectrum, we believe now, is protective against the development of myopia. So we actually discourage UV blockers. We, we want the patient to, uh, the, the child to, to ex have a natural exposure to, to UV. You know, the hunter-gatherers and the cavemen didn't have uh, sunglasses. Um, and I, when we say choose parents who are not bio myopic, it's because if you inherit your, your parents' lifestyle, you know, so if your parents had a myopic lifestyle, you'd probably inherit the lifestyle um, of, of them, and of course you'd also inherit their genes, and if those genes aren't protective against myopia, you're more likely to, to develop myopia. So, I mean, here is a hunter-gatherer scene, um, and I couldn't find one that didn't involve meat. Um, so, I, I'm not aware of any cave paintings showing gathering corn or berries or something like that. So, maybe it's something that we do. But when you think about the, the lifestyle of the human, our predecessors, um, it, it was outdoors. It was. It got dark and you went to sleep. There was no. You, you know, you might have a fire, but it, it's not the same as a 50 uh, watt LED LED bulb. So our whole visual environment was was different, and most of the time we were spent looking in, in the distance. And even when we built houses. They may give us indoors, but the outdoor, you, you, know, you had a window, you know, you, you could see the horizon as it were. The, we weren't in this dioptrically um, very high plus uh, or high minus, or whatever, or everything is up close all, all, all the time. And we lived in daylight, we, we, lived, uh, we lived with the light of the sun. And I did some measurements around my house recently in preparation for this talk. And it was a, an ordinary bright, sunny day. And I took some, some measurements from outdoors in the garden to indoors at the desk where it, we might read a book or, or, or study a, a, a magazine or something like that. And this was taken within minutes, seconds really. So, so it's not like hours different than the sun had gone behind a cloud. It was all the same thing. So in the garden, I had 44,000 lux, which is a, a lux, as you know, is a measurement of light. 44, a thousand times less. But it, it, it didn't feel dark. It, it, it felt like a, you know, this was a desk by a, a big full height window. And of course, under cover, you know, just under an awning or something like that, it's still 14,000. So you can see the huge drop in illumination just from going to, from the garden to indoors on this, within seconds, of, you know, the same light, 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 level of light. So the amount of light we, we live in typically is way less than we're designed to live in by a factor, by a, a factor of a thousand. It's, it's an enormous number. And ultraviolet, we may, if you measure it outside, it's, it was 1.4 milliwatts per cubic centimeter, a square centimeter, and it was like nothing inside. So this is the light we're living in now, large. I mean, how many of us spend significant hours outdoors, uh, and, and how many children do live in this light? We all live in this light, and I'm certain that this is um, uh, a very, very much a contributor to the, uh, this pandemic of myopia. 
And of course, outdoors is diopterically flat. You're, you're looking in the distance, um, you're looking for the berries and the fruit and so on, in, in the hunter-gatherer, as well as looking out for predators. So I, I wish I'd had my camera at the time, but there was a, a woodpecker in our garden, and he was digging into the grass to find, uh, I presume, insects. And every, he, his head would go into the hole and come straight up, and he's looking around. And then he, so of the, say he's digging for three minutes in, in the, for only about 20 seconds is he looking down the hole. The rest of the three minutes he's looking for the fox and the hawk and so on. Um, so he, he wants to stay in the gene pool. And if, of course, uh, you know, the same for us, if you spend too much time looking uh, close to, you're not going to, you're not going to be around for, to, to make your contribution to the gene pool anyway. And I, I think that we have to remember that accommodation was properly only designed for very brief uses, to make sure that, that it is a berry, not a piece of rabbit poo, so that when you put it in your mouth, it's nutritious and not otherwise, and then you're looking in, in the distance. But now when you think about it, we, our lives are almost all within arm's reach, almost always in arm's reach. And now, this is, uh, we went to uh, the World Cup in, in Japan um, last autumn, and this was in a stadium um, in, in Japan, and this was a, a typical Japanese family, and so we've got a whole stadium in front of us, in daylight, and to keep the child happy, so-called, they give an iPhone. And this is the grandmother, and she's about, what, minus eight? And next to her is the daughter, and she's about minus 10, and the father is about minus 10 as well. And I, I thought this was an iconic example of, of why even outdoors were encouraging children to look closely at, at illuminated screens in the belief that it's, uh, it's um, uh, helpful or beneficial to them. So at my end of my epic, what do, what do we monitor? We monitor particularly axillary. We're not so much interested in the um, the, the, the dioptric, the, the refraction in terms of dioptric. Of course, that's very important. But it's the axial length that's going to blind these patients. We also measure lens thickness, ACD, uh, corneal thickness. We map. We do a wavefront analysis. We map. The, the cornea, front and back, we do tear film, pupillography, we do everything we can think of, including macular OCT, for reasons you'll see in, in a moment, and of course slit lamp photography, and we leave the refraction correction to the optometrist. We don't want to get into my sight and ortho K and, and glasses and so on, because we're not good at it, that's what you're good at, and uh, we, we, we prefer to work with our optometrist to, to, to deal with this, this, this issue. So, um, this is uh, our current myopic control methods. Uh, we, we emphasize the amotropic lifestyle or the hunter-gatherer li lifestyle. We say you should be in multifocal contacts no matter what the age. Uh, we have children as young as, I think our youngest is about six wearing multifocal contact lenses, and they're, they're brilliant. Uh, they, I mean, if you, we had a, a nine-year-old, and. Uh, he, he, he's, he's coming for his checkup, and I said, you got your lenses in? He said, yeah. I said, can you take them out? Now, he just went, yeah, sure, and bumped. And they're out in a second, like, whereas an adult, oh, yeah, but what are they doing? He didn't even wash his hands, he just within, like, went to the bin, they were both in the bin, continue on. So, it was second nature to him. He just was so easy with them. It was, it was really encouraging to see, and we know that, we know that, that that's the case. Um, if they can if they prefer, they might try ortho K, and we also give them, we offer them atropine, and almost all our patients are on atropine, um, and we only allow them a spectacle correction if they're unable to have contacts, for reasons that other speakers on this podium have, have talked about in the past. And we also try to set a target. So if we've got a child whose axial length is say 24.9 or something, we might say, okay, we want by the age of 20 that you don't go beyond 26 millimeters. So we don't set a refraction target in our clinic, um, which we could do and maybe we will, will do, but more importantly, we set an axial length target. We try to say, if we can keep this child below that axial length, 
that'll be good. Now we have children who are already, you know, 26, 27 millimeters, um, but we set them a target that's different, obviously. But we want we want to try and keep the actual length as, as small as possible. And another parameter we look at is the choroidal thickness. And our colleagues in, in Japan found that if we, if we measure the choroidal thickness and just take it as a reference point, 2.5 or 250 microns from the fovea towards the optic nerve, and measure choroidal thickness there, anything above 60 microns is good. Um, and they also told us that um, when they put the child into, say, ortho K, within two weeks they can document an increase in an increase in the uh, choroidal thickness, which really, really, really fascinated. And look at his choroid. I mean, it's he's only nine. Um, and in this particular child, so I said to him, I'm not happy that you're doing all the things you should be doing. He said, oh, I'll have laser when I'm 20. And I really had to explain to him and his mother that we can do the laser now. We can go you know, into the laser room, switch it on, and get rid of your minus five, minus two now. This is what's going to blind you. Because if his choroid looks like this at nine, what's it going to look like when he's older? Because here, are, here is a... This happens to be a friend of ours who went to their optometrist and the optometrist said, I think there's something wrong with your macula, and she's a myope, and she's fairly asymptomatic, but this is her macula in, at the age of early 40s. No trauma, nothing. Um, and then we've got, here's another patient. This is a 50, 49, 50 year old patient. Uh, and this is, look, I mean, and you can see almost no choroid, um, the bowing, the staphyloma, um, and although she can see, how long is this retina going to hang on? Um, and then you've got the real extreme scenario where you've got this massive staphyloma, and uh, as long as the retina stays in place, the patient would you know, be okay. I mean, they've got a good photoreceptor there at the macula and so on. But out in the periphery, it's, it's really uh, very disastrous. And this is what we're trying to stop. Not keep them in the laser range or anything like that, it's just trying to keep their retina healthy so that by the time they're fully grown into adults, they don't have a retina that looks like this. So, you, you, this has been emphasized by other speakers, if those of you who've attended other talks here on myopia, is that for every one diopter, increase, you get a 40-fold increase in the risk of blindness. So the difference between one diopter, minus one diopter, and minus two diopters is 40 times. So if your risk is whatever, at one diopter, it's 40 times higher at two diopters. And it's 160 times higher at three diopters. So what is it at eight and nine diopters, and ten diopters? So every diopter matters, which was a good little uh, buzzword, buzz phrase from one of the speakers uh, here. Every diopter does matter. I mean, th these are the things that these people face. It's retinal detachment, retinal degeneration, cataract glaucoma, uh, and just the bother of being a myope. I mean, it's not fun. Nobody chooses to be a myope. Um, so what sort of results have we had so far? Well, here is um, just a, we've got some, a, a, well, we're, in, we're in, well into three figures now of, of patients. I just pulled up some, some results. So here's the axial length at the start, and here's the of right eye, and this is the axial length after some uh, six months of treatment. This is the change, and this is the le left eye. Now you can see some of them are, look, here this one, this left eye of this child, has gone from 25.75 to 26.05. That's a 300 micron increase in six months. That's very worrying. And this is despite treatment uh, and so on. But here's, a, here's a, two cases uh, that have done better. Um, and I have to say that although our numbers are small in terms of studies, we're finding that children who do everything they can slow down more than those who are blasé about it and wear glasses and just put the drops in and don't try to get outdoors and don't try to uh, limit their screen time. Those who, who really go for it, go for the whole package, the emetropic lifestyle, multifocal contacts, or, or ortho K, atropine, and, 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 and so on, they're the ones who tend to be in this group where the axial length has, has not elongated uh, very significantly. 
So, and, and which is summarized in, in this in this slide. So, as I say, it, it, we emphasize that the treatment is not in the bottle. The treatment is the whole thing, the whole the whole package, as it were. And of course, you you'll find this when you if those of you who are who haven't found it already is that when you say to children, you know, families, you've got to get outdoors more. They say, oh, it's cold outside. Um, and I say, well, there's, there's only inappropriate clothing, not inappropriate weather. Um, and so you know, we all grew up. Most of us of our age group grew up like where rain and didn't matter. Um, and they, they, by the time they get home from school, it's already dark, so there's no point going out. Uh, they, they, they love to read. I'm amazed how many young of these young myopes are addicted to reading. They read almost constantly, books, uh, laptops, everything. They read, read, read. They've read, you know, War and Peace almost. And I, th I think we should really stop praising children to learn, having learned, from learning to read. I mean, even our own children, we were very proud of them when they could read, but actually maybe we shouldn't be, be doing so. We need to be thinking differently, which is something I'll come on, come on to. And schools, of course, have other priorities. You, you, go to a, you go to your child's school and say, we need to build a perspex classroom. I mean, they can barely keep the roof on the, on the school, never mind building a new classroom and so on. So, um, and of course, it's all nowadays, everything, oh, you know, kids nowadays are always on their screen. Well, they need to understand that being on their screen, they're visually depriving the peripheral retina, and they're going to blind themselves when they're, up, when they're, when they're older. And it, it, I think they, there should be an app <laughs> that says this, <laughs> as it were. Um, and um, so, as I say, most of them really has not grasped it. So, but we, we make some suggestions. Here's a, uh, an idea that could be a good for, for families sort of, of myopes. So instead of sitting uh, in the house, they, they could be um, using one of these. I did some measurements and, okay, daylight was 22,000 looks and inside this thing was 16,000, so a lot better. There was a minimal amount of UV transmission, um, not a lot, but a minimal, but at least it would be, in my opinion, it would be better to be doing your homework in this or sitting out in this during the daytime than being um, than being indoors at a desk with 44 looks and no UV. Um, so these are the ways we have to start thinking differently uh, about myopia. And of course, there may well be different subgroups. So one one myope child might be myopic for a, a reason different to another myopic child. So a child with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, that may be a completely different reason that that child is minus eight than another child of the same age who doesn't have trisomy 21 is minus eight. And there may be ROP, we know that children with ROP get, get myopia as well, uh, and, and that's possibly a completely different mechanism, or it could be exactly the same mechanism, because what happens to the peripheral retina in ROP? It's usually destroyed by either treatment or by the condition itself. So they may not have those factors that regulate the eye growth, and that's why the eye just keeps growing, because it doesn't know what to, what to do as well. So we need to know more about this. This is all part of, hopefully, research that will evolve with, with time. And of course, different treatments may have different effects in each group. So what's good treatment for one group of patients may be bad treatment for another and vice versa. So we need to, we need to, know, we need to know more about it. We, we only are scratching the surface, but we, we have to keep going. We have to keep doing something about it. So um, what, what next? I, I think even optometry is unaware, and even ophthalmology, actually, is unaware of, of what's in, what the impending cataclysm that's coming in, in myopia. Um, you, know, the, the, you know, as I said already, 500 million people blind from myopia, as I said, the EU population. And um, it, it's a bit like global warming and plastic. It's, every, it's my responsibility. It's your responsibility. It's everybody's responsibility that myopia is stopped because we know enough to slow it down and we hopefully will know enough to stop it altogether within the next maybe decade if, if, if we're lucky. And schools need to, to, be, to realize that they're a hazard, that the school system is probably a contributor 
um, uh, to, to, to the myopia epidemic, and they need to learn, uh, they need to evolve and learn a new way of providing education without damaging the, 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 the child's eyes and, and, and uh, vision. One of my patients said, oh, my son is an optician, and he's developed an app that when the, it sees the child's face on the face recognition for a given length of time, it turns off. And I thought, that's very clever. So he's developed this app, so with the child on the iPhone, if he's there for too long, it switches off. Uh, and in, then he said, and he's been offered three million for the company. So there's a good reason, financial as well, to be interested in myopia. Uh, I've no doubt that this patient was telling me uh, the truth. Uh, I mean, so, but you can see that there is a lot of people interested in myopia and in ways of helping children uh, uh, not be myopic. Um, and and we, at my eye clinic, we have a, one of our staff is training to be uh, someone who would go to a school during uh, uh, assembly and give a, teach about myopia to the whole school, the teachers as well as the as the children, so that they they, they don't uh, sort of fall foul of, of, of being becoming more and more myopic. And of course, I was in Waterstones just before Christmas and I saw this, I thought that's a great idea. This this would allow the 2022 rule to be implemented. Do you know the 2022 rule? For every 20 minutes of reading, they should look at the horizon for 20 seconds, right? It's a way of interrupting prolonged close work. It's, you know, for 2020, uh, so it's 20 minutes reading, 20 seconds looking at the horizon, and two hours a day outdoors, 2022, right? Um, I thought this is, this is great, but then when I looked close, more closely at it, it's actually encouraging children to persist reading. And it's got, you know, Dr. Zeus, a well-known brand for children. And it actually it says, the more you read, the more things you will know, the more things you learn, the more places you will go. And this is like, this is, as a profession, we need to, as I say on the slide, we need to fight this ignorance. We need to say, hey, this is, this is damaging. This, is, you, this device is going to make, it's going to increase the number of people who are going to go blind. So... And if we look at our schools nowadays, we, we, we believe well, children should have a visually stimulating environment and, and uh, we should have lots of things for them to be looking at and keep them engaged and not let them get bored and, and so on. And then we wind up with a classroom like this, which is dioptrically multi-layered, full of uh, closed work. The windows are blocked out. So we're actually just putting them into a the sort of environment you would put a monkey or a or a chick to make them myopic. And we're doing it from eight in the morning to three in the afternoon and later. Whereas in China, uh, this approach is, 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 is being adapted, adopted more widely, which is a, 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 room made, a classroom made of perspex. Perspex, uh, if normal perspex, does transmit UV as well. So you, within this room you get the full range of the wavelengths of natural daylight. So these children, I think in these schools, they, they must spend a minimum of two hours having lessons in these sort of classes. And um, so that, and if you look closely, not many of them are wearing glasses actually. So there are, I'm all wearing my side, or it's, it's worked. Um, but you know, China knows that it's facing a cataclysm of blindness uh, in the next couple of decades and so on. So they're really having to do something about it. So it, this is what I think we should be doing here in, in, in this country. So the last slide is we have to start thinking differently about, about myopia. Forget, tear up your textbook, right? So don't give them a correction in glasses. And, uh, that sounds crazy, but I'm not the only one saying that. I'm, I'm not the only speaker on this podium who said glasses is not option one. Um, and you have a chance, I mean, this, I, I, like I said earlier, this is an opportunity for optometry to save people from blindness. I know you find patients with glaucoma and diabetes, but then you refer them to 
for someone like me to th save their vision. But this is where you do the treatment and you save their vision. And it's, I think it's, this is the first, uh, you're the first to the scene. You're, you're the first, uh, what's the first aider or the first responder. Um, you're the ones who find the myopic uh, child at five, six, seven years of age or, or whatever. And I think it's important that you just start the conversation. You just say, even if you're in a chain that doesn't do my sight and so on, you still have to say, in my view, you've got, your child has myopia, uh, there are, he needs, you need now to think about his lifestyle or her lifestyle and how we're going to address this issue so that we prevent and minimize the damage that the myopia might cause to them during, during their lifestyle. And, um, and, and if you, you know, if you don't believe me, go and Google it. You know, so that you tell them they need multifocal contact lenses. Many parents go, oh, they're really pushing hard. They must have, they must be in financial difficulty. They're trying to sell contact lenses even to children. But if you say, go and Google it, and they do, and they find about my site, and they find out multifocal, and they find out the pandemic of, of myopia, that they will respect you as a proper professional and so on. And, Offer them your support and, and your professional treatment, and say if you. I would say I, I know a lot of you don't do my sight, but I mean if you do soft contact lenses, you can do my sight or natural view. So you don't. Although you have to get a little stamp from Cooper Vision to pre prescribe my sight, I would say you, I would say please do it, and and then maybe get into ortho K so that you can offer what contemporarily effective in, for children with myopia, and obviously if they can't handle it or the parents don't want it or the child really resists, then they can have, have, have glasses. But please, you know, make a difference. Um, uh, at, you know, those, at the moment, the only way these children can have atropine is to come to a clinic like ours, um, but even if they come to us for atropine, we will send them back to you for the my site and our ortho K. We, um, so please, you know, as I say, uh, make, try and make a difference. It's, it's a very important. It's, it's, it's most. It's most important. It's a most important um, uh, topic. It's probably the most, It's probably at least as important as picking up glaucoma or, or even a detached retina or whatever. Um, that's my last slide. Um, and I know that you're all really reluctant to go. You've had such a great weekend. Um, I'm, obviously, I'm happy to take questions and queries. Either you come up and speak with me or. We have a roving microphone, I believe. Um, yeah. I think I think you got your hand up first. I think. We're always taught about the perils of UV light, so that we were all on the macula, the lens. We've always been encouraged to give sunglasses, etc. Are you specifically saying that we should not do that? Yes. Um, it's a bit like red wine. Shade. You know. One, one, one year red wine is good for you, the next year is bad for you, um, and so on. So yes, we, we, the evidence is that the blue end of the spectrum is protective and that we shouldn't um, uh, avoid, we shouldn't avoid it. Now I'm not saying that children should be on the beach with no sun protection or, uh, and so on, but, but in, in ordinary daylight, yes, they should not, they should let, they should experience the full. And that's the advantage of the MySight contact lenses, it transmits UV. The other, most of the other ones don't, uh, but, but one, of the, one of the upsides of why we like the idea of MySight from Cooper Vision is that they trans, it transmits UV. Thank you for your nice lecture. I'm very much wondering your comment. You have said in Singapore 97% children are mild, yeah. which I have seen 42 years ago when I worked there as a criminologist. But you told that genetic has no influence on the mild, mm -hmm. rather it is environmental. But research said both are equally important. As for example, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, in Asia, their children are too much myopic and they are growing too much. Yeah. So I am not sure which one I should admit and follow. But the, 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 when we say it's not genetic, what we mean is that if you took that family of myopes out of the center of Tokyo or uh, Singapore, and let them grow up in a rural environment from, from day one, they almost certainly will not be myopic. So it's not that their genetic 
um, uh, makeup determines that they will definitely be myopic. Now, if the same thing with height, you know, so you, if somebody grows to six foot in one place or in another place, give the diet the, the same and so on. So that is genetic, the eye color and so on. It's it's it is in the it's in the code on the DNA. But myopia, we believe, is not. Susceptibility to developing myopia, yes, there are genes that make you more susceptible, but they don't cause you to be myopic. My second question, you told that do not give a correction in classes. Yeah. In this factor, I found many children coming from the school side testing program, their parents are bringing to optometrist or the doctors for their myopic correction. So, there are two, three children are wearing glass, they are okay with it. And the school said he cannot read the uh, blackboard things, so take the uh, child to the optometrist or the doctor for management. In that case, usually still now, we and optometrists are prescribing the glasses. So if you say do not give correction in glasses, what is the substitute advice or management? I can't follow you. Can you repeat? Because you know that do not give correction in glasses. Yeah. A child came around seven, eight years old to a doctor or the optometrist yeah. for the myopic correction. If we do not prescribe any glass and he cannot see the uh, blood you, you, pre you prescribe them contact lenses are both okay. But, but the, nowadays, uh, still the parents and the environment and the uh, yes. traditional way to prescribe glasses then contact the, the parents say, oh, I don't want my child having contact lenses. Yeah. Yes. Well, you have to educate them. You have to tell them that glasses will let them see the board, but it won't deal with the peripheral defocus, and it'll make them more myopic, ultimately. It, it, it's, it's a question of, this is where you are a professional, and the family have come to you for your professional advice, and your professional advice is that the best way of looking after your vision for the whole of your life is for you now to start wearing multifocal contact lenses, or to have ortho -K, uh, correction for your, you know, either way for your myopia. I can't hear, um, my hearing is not as good as it used to be. I don't know what your objection is. Because currently, National Health Services do not pay for multifocal contact lens now. So, the, so the, the, national, national, the National Health Service is not the medical profession. No. It is not the optometric profession. But so what it says is one thing, what science says is something else. But so the, uh, there's no point discussing it. I'm, you know, I, I, just because the NHS won't pay for multifocal contact lenses, to me that's irrelevant. T tell that to the peripheral retina. Um, that's, that's true, but our practice say about more than 60% come for the NSH patient. So what the NHS decides to do with an epidemic of myopia is for the NHS to deal with. But the, the science is the science. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other, one more question over here? Oh, what? I did want to add to the gentleman's comments because I do think, um, I know you're talking about your clinic, but we do have to think about a population. And there is some evidence to say that myopic levels are high in, or higher in more deprived populations. So if we only are able to offer the treatment to people that can currently afford it, mm -hmm. the divide, those people that are going blind are those people that, can, that can't afford correction now. Mm -hmm. And I know it's not your personal problem, mm -hmm. but I'd like to know your answer to that problem. Um, you, you, I, it, it's, I can't see how it's... Um, if I worry about that, if I concern myself with that, it doesn't help anybody. I, I'm, you know, the, 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 the access to uh, treatment and healthcare 
is a separate issue. It, 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 um, the, the science is science, and politics is politics, and health economics is, is part of the latter. Um, you, you, I'm sure you're not suggesting that we deprive some people from some treatment because everybody can't have it. I, I, I mean, that's not that's not a, a, a solution. And equality, inequality is part of the human condition. Uh, it'd be nice to solve it, and uh, I would support any any um, efforts that would help uh, give equal um, opportunity to everybody. I mean, I'm I'm a, a, I'm evidence of equal opportunity. You know, I you know I. I went to a scholarship to go to school and, and, and so on. I went to a free university. I didn't have to pay uh, fees, etc. So I'm, I'm very much in, in, uh, in support of helping as many people as, as we can. But yeah, it is the fact that some people will be able to access the treatment and some people for economic reasons won't be able to access it. And that doesn't change the fact that this treatment is effective and we need to keep pushing forward to find the complete solution to the problem of, of myopia. Like, for example, one of our visitors to the booth was minus four. She was the only, the first generation of myopia in her family. So if you trace her lineage all the way back to caveman and stone age, ice age man, none of them were myopic. None of them. They were all emotropic. So what's gone wrong? That's what we need to solve.